Ukraine's advances near Bakhmut threaten Russia's flanks. Live updates. Kyiv's gains near Bakhmut raise alarms in Russia that Ukraine's counteroffensive has begun. Kramatorsk, Ukraine. The Ukrainian army is advancing in localized attacks near the eastern city of Bakhmut, Ukrainian commanders said on Friday, in fighting that has shifted the front line only slightly but is setting off alarms in Russia that Kyiv's long anticipated counteroffensive has begun. Ukrainian soldiers broke through Russian lines south of the city on Wednesday and have since exploited this breach and assaulted Russian forces elsewhere near Bakhmut, the Ukrainian military said, threatening their flanks to the north and south. Bakhmut has been at the epicenter of the war in eastern Ukraine for months and had been the only location on the roughly 600-mile front where Russia was consistently on the attack. Videos released on Friday by Ukraine's 3rd Separate Assault Brigade showed soldiers piling out of armored personnel carriers and assaulting a Russian trench. Forward, forward. A soldier yelled in the video filmed on a helmet camera. The soldiers dived for cover as Russian fighters threw a hand grenade, then ran forward and threw their own grenade into a Russian bunker. Andriy Beletsky, who has ultimate command of the brigade, among other units in the Ukrainian army, said on Friday that his forces were continuing the counterattack near Bakhmut. A drone operator in the Adam Tactical Group, who asked to be identified only by his nickname, Sem, described a seesaw battle to the south of Bakhmut overnight in which Russian soldiers tried to recapture a position but were repelled with a Ukrainian artillery bombardment. Near Chasov Yar, the unceasing thunder from artillery and rocket fire echoed across the rolling hills as Ukrainian forces targeted Russian positions to the north and south of Bakhmut. That is all our fire going to the Russian side, said a 36-year-old soldier who could only be identified by his call sign, Bandit, in accordance with military regulations. While the Ukrainians were making progress, he said there was still a hard fight ahead as Russians raced in reinforcements. For now, he said, Ukrainian soldiers were testing each Russian position and clearing one forest belt after another. A retreat from Bakhmut would represent an embarrassing setback for the Russian military. Now mostly ruins, Bakhmut is not seen as strategically important but has become a symbolic prize. Russia, which has not captured a Ukrainian city since last July, had pressed ahead despite soaring losses. It was difficult to gauge whether Ukraine's advances would be sustained. Russian forces had at one point flushed Ukrainian troops out of all but a few blocks in the city. That is presenting Russia with a difficult choice. If Russia does not reinforce the flanking positions around Bakhmut, it risks a politically humiliating setback. But if it diverts reserve forces there, it could weaken defenses in the south. Ukrainian officials have downplayed the advances and have not portrayed them as the start of a widely anticipated counteroffensive. President Volodymyr Zelensky, in an interview with the BBC this week, said Ukraine wanted more weaponry and ammunition to arrive before it would begin the offensive. The commander of Ukraine's ground forces, General Alexander Sersky, also has taken pains to distinguish the attacks in Bakhmut from the broader offensive. In a statement on Wednesday, he described Ukraine's actions there as mostly defensive in nature, saying that Ukrainian soldiers have been able to carry out effective counterattacks. But Russian military bloggers have responded with alarm to Kyiv's gains in the north and south of Bakhmut. The bloggers, who often report from the front lines and can be influential within Russia, are fiercely pro-war and want Moscow to commit more resources to the fight. Alexander Yaremchuk, a Russian military correspondent aligned with the Wagner mercenary group, wrote that, Wagner gave a lot of blood and sweat for this territory. Some gave their lives. It's hard for me to believe that other units are so easily abandoning their positions. Their outcry elicited a rare direct response from Russia's Ministry of Defense, which denied a turn for the worse in the battle. Declarations on Telegram about a breakthrough on several points on the front line do not correspond to reality, it said in a statement. Yevgeny V. Prigozhin, the head of Wagner and whose fighters have led the nearly year-long fight for Bakhmut, appeared to support the blogger's assessment of Ukrainian breakthroughs. On Thursday, Mr. Prigozhin posted an open letter to Russia's defense minister, Sergei K. Shaigu, about the losses on the flanking positions, saying that, the enemy carried out several successful counterattacks. Tensions among Russia's disparate forces are spilling into the open as the Ukrainian military exerts more pressure on them around Bakhmut, increasing concerns among some prominent war supporters ahead of Kyiv's announced counteroffensive. The chief of the Wagner mercenary group, Yevgeny V. Prigozhin, who has long been an aggressive critic of Russia's military leaders, 
This week issued a series of expletive-laden audio and video messages, moving into new territory with comments that some observers interpreted as his first direct criticism of President Vladimir V. Putin of Russia. Cracks appeared elsewhere, too, as the Chechen strongman Ramzan Kadyrov, whose paramilitary forces have fought alongside Wagner in Ukraine, criticized Mr. Prigozhin, his longtime ally, in a video broadside. The public feuding added to a sense of disarray among Russia's military leaders and its various forces fighting in Ukraine, as Kyiv appeared to step up attacks deeper into Russian-controlled territory. Ukrainian forces this week confirmed a Wagner claim that they had broken through Russian positions on the southern flank of the embattled eastern city of Bakhmut. Russia's defense ministry has not responded directly to Mr. Prigozhin's recent criticism but issued a statement late Thursday saying that comments, spread by individual telegram channels about defense breakthroughs in various sections of the line of contact are not true. Some prominent Russian pro-war bloggers warned that the recriminations were beginning to affect battlefield performance at a crucial moment in the campaign. We have a mass of people at the front, and no one can reach an agreement with each other, wrote one blogger, Anastasia Kosheverova, in an analysis of the recent Russian setbacks around Bakhmut. Bloggers and activists affiliated with Mr. Prigozhin have moved from targeting senior military commanders to criticizing the Russian army as a whole. They claimed that Wagner had been making progress inside Bakhmut, while regular Russian units were sustaining losses on the city's outskirts. Army units shamefully abandoned their positions and ran away in a crying fit. One military blogger, who publishes under the moniker A.P. Wagner, wrote on the Telegram messaging app on Thursday. But others appeared to grow tired of Mr. Prigozhin's outspokenness. In a video published on Monday, Mr. Kadyrov accused Mr. Prigozhin of overestimating his military achievements at the expense of other pro-Moscow fighters. When you were in trouble and you needed a brotherly shoulder, you used to call your Chechen brothers, he said, addressing the Wagner founder. But today, I'm surprised, by Mr. Prigozhin's boasting, he added. Mr. Prigozhin has also been criticized by the ultranationalist former Russian paramilitary leader Igor Gherkin, who remains influential among parts of the country's security establishment. On Tuesday, Mr. Gherkin wrote that the Wagner chief's complaints served to shift blame for his own failure to capture Bakhmut after a nine-month battle. In his messages this week, Mr. Prigozhin accused the army of leaving his fighters in Bakhmut exposed to escalating Ukrainian flank attacks. He has also ratcheted up his months-long complaints about ammunition supply, blaming the shortages in one video on a happy grandpa, an unspecified reference that echoed a common nickname for Mr. Putin. Mr. Prigozhin later said that grandpa referred to a senior Russian military official whose name he did not specify. China will send an envoy to Russia and Ukraine in a quest for peace talks. A Chinese government envoy will visit Ukraine and Russia next week in an attempt to help negotiate an end to the war a Chinese government spokesman said on Friday. China had announced its intention to send the official, Li Wei, the government's special representative for Eurasian affairs, after a phone call last month between its top leader, Xi Jinping, and Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky. Beijing had said that Mr. Li would conduct in-depth communication with all parties to try to reach a political settlement. Beijing has been trying to position itself as a potential peace broker in the war especially as Mr. Xi casts himself as a global statesman and China as an alternative to the United States for global leadership. In February, China issued what it described as a 12-point peace plan for Ukraine, though Western officials criticized it as lacking substance. Still, since the war broke out in February 2022, many in the West have looked to the role that China could play. Kyiv has described China, which has a close partnership with Russia, as potentially the only country with enough sway to persuade President Vladimir V Putin of Russia to end the war. But the close ties between Moscow and Beijing have also spurred concerns in Europe and the United States that China might in fact act to help Russia's war effort. Mr. Li, the special representative, has his own long history in Russia. He served as China's ambassador there for 10 years, and in 2019, Mr. Putin awarded him a Medal of Friendship. Beijing on Friday offered few details about what Mr. Li would do in Ukraine and Russia or whom he would meet. The trip is expected to begin on Monday, and Mr. Li will also visit France, Germany and Poland, a spokesman for the foreign ministry, Wang Wenbin, said at a regularly scheduled briefing. Mr. Wang reiterated the Chinese government's line that it is neutral in the conflict, though it has refused to call Russia's actions an invasion.
This is another demonstration of China's commitment to promoting and urging peace talks, he said of Mr. Li's trip. The international community's calls for a ceasefire and end to the war are growing louder and louder, and China is willing to play a constructive role. Turkish opposition leader accuses Kremlin of election meddling, straining a strategic alliance. A Turkish opposition leader on Friday doubled down on accusations that Russia is interfering in the country's election, adding uncertainty over the future of one of the region's most important strategic partnerships. The opposition leader, Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, who holds a slight edge in most polls over the long-serving incumbent Recep Tayyip Erdogan in the race for president, told Reuters on Friday that he has evidence of Russia manufacturing deep fake videos to influence Sunday's vote. He did not provide details. Mr. Kilikdurgalu's claim came after he accused Moscow in a Twitter post on Thursday of being behind the montages, conspiracies, deep fakes and tapes that were exposed in this country yesterday. Get your hands off the Turkish state, he wrote in Turkish and Russian. We are still in favor of cooperation and friendship. The Kremlin spokesman, Dmitry S. Peskov, on Friday denied the accusations, saying that any interference in Turkish elections is out of the question. Mr. Kilikdurgalu's criticism raised questions about the future of an economic and at times strategic partnership that Mr. Erdogan has cultivated with Moscow during his 20 years in power. Though it is a member of NATO, Turkey under Mr. Erdogan has become Russia's indispensable trading partner and at times a diplomatic intermediary, a relationship that has assumed an even greater importance for the Kremlin since the invasion of Ukraine. The two long serving leaders share an authoritarian streak and confrontational rhetoric toward the West emphasizing historical grievances against other world powers. But Mr. Putin and Mr. Erdogan's partnership was always based on mutual self-interest, rather than ideological affinity, and the two countries compete for influence in the Caucasus and Middle East. Most notably, the two leaders back different factions in the armed conflicts in Syria and Libya. Relations grew tense after Turkey shot down a Russian fighter jet in 2015. For Russia, Turkey has become a source of imports, a market for its oil and gas, and a crucial link to the global economy amid tightening Western sanctions. The Kremlin also sees in Mr. Erdogan's often confrontational nationalist rhetoric the potential to disrupt its opponent NATO. For its part, Turkey has benefited from cheap Russian energy, Russian investment and revenues from Russian tourism, which have only risen since the start of the war. Russia is building Turkey's first nuclear power plant and, since the start of the Ukraine war, has announced plans to make the country a hub for its natural gas trade. Mr. Erdogan has refused to join Western sanctions against Russia and has presented himself as a mediator for Moscow's war on Ukraine, most recently by brokering a deal to allow the export of Ukraine grain. But Mr. Erdogan has stopped short from offering Mr. Putin direct support in the war, and his government has angered Moscow by allowing the sale of Turkish armed drones to Ukraine. Mr. Kilikdorolu, the opposition leader, has promised to maintain economic ties to Russia if he wins the presidency, but it remains unclear whether he would maintain Mr. Erdogan's delicate balancing act in Ukraine. We should make it clear that we do not find it right for any country to occupy another country, he told Reuters in the Friday interview. Top EU diplomat vows to stand with Ukraine for the long haul. The European Union's top diplomat again voiced the bloc's strong support for Ukraine in its struggle against Russia on Friday vowing that Europe would not tire of supporting Kyiv on or off the battlefield, as the Kremlin might hope. The bloc must continue to give Ukraine immediate, practical support on the battlefield in the form of arms, while preparing long-term commitments of humanitarian and economic aid, said the diplomat, Josep Borrell Fontels, adding that it would continue to work toward the country's accession to the European Union, our ultimate commitment. Speaking at a joint news conference with the Swedish foreign minister following an informal meeting of EU, Foreign ministers in Stockholm, Mr. Burrell stressed Russia's responsibility for the war, saying Ukraine had to keep fighting if it wanted to continue to exist as a nation. He reiterated his support for President Volodymyr Zelensky's proposed peace plan, which the Kremlin has fully rejected because it would require surrendering all captured Ukrainian territory. We want peace, but we want a capitulation. We don't want Ukraine to become the second Belarus, Mr. Burrell said referring to the former Soviet nation that has long been held under Moscow's sphere of influence. The meeting of the bloc's foreign ministers comes as Kyiv's allies wait for a long-promised counteroffensive that is widely seen as a test of whether Ukraine's military, armed with more sophisticated heavy weapons from the West, can prevail over the Russian army.
The ministers also discussed Europe's shifting relationship with China, which has grown increasingly tense over Beijing's support of Moscow. China's decisions have consequences for the European Union's interests and security, and the bloc will not hesitate to use the tools at our disposal to protect them, warned the Swedish foreign minister, Tobias Bilstrom. The bloc's foreign ministers are set to meet on Saturday with Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmitro Ikuliba, to continue discussions about supporting Ukrainian forces and holding Russia accountable, Mr. Bilstrom said. Russian ordered evacuations near Ukraine's Zaporizhia nuclear plant alarm officials. Kyiv, Ukraine. The situation at the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant is growing more precarious as the Russian occupation authorities shutter essential services in the nearest town, evacuate residents and exert new stresses on beleaguered employees, Ukrainian officials and the United Nations watchdog agency warned this week. While all six reactors at the Russian-occupied facility are shut down, workers still need to keep critical safety equipment operating in order to prevent a possibly catastrophic release of radiation. Pressure on those employees deepened this week as the Russian occupation authorities began closing banks, shops and key services in Enerhodar, the town where the remaining plant workers and their families live, and relocating residents before a looming Ukrainian counteroffensive. The order was part of a series of mandatory evacuations that the Russian occupation authorities have commenced in parts of southern Ukraine moves framed by Moscow as a humanitarian effort because of intensified fighting but which the Ukrainians say are a reflection of Russian fears about a counteroffensive. Last year, Moscow's forces ordered a similar evacuation in the Kherson region weeks before withdrawing from the western bank of the Dnipro River. Petro Kotin, the head of Ukraine's nuclear operator, Energodom, said in an interview on Thursday that he did not believe that Ukrainian forces would directly attack the Zaporizhia nuclear plant which Russian troops have occupied since early in the war, as part of any offensive, but that they could seek to surround the area and cut off Moscow's forces. Since Evgeny Belitsky, the Russian-appointed governor of occupied Zaporizhia, issued the mandatory evacuation order last week, he has said little publicly about what is happening. It is unclear how many residents have left. Mr. Grossi said Russian officials had told him that for the moment there is no evacuation order for the staff of the plant. But Mr. Koten, who is in touch with some workers still at the plant, said they expressed concern that the Russian authorities had begun drawing up plans to evacuate some employees. The staff is divided between those who signed contracts with the plant's Russian operator, the nuclear energy conglomerate Rosatom, and employees who have refused to do so. Mr. Koten said employees at the plant had told him that Russians were making plans to evacuate only those staff members who had signed on with Rosatom about 2,700 of the 4,600 workers. It was not possible to verify their accounts. Mr. Koten said he believed that the Russians would still find workers to keep the plant's critical equipment running. I cannot tell you for sure what is in their mind, Mr. Koten said. I know Russians are crazy but not that crazy to leave the reactors without control. The recent developments have further complicated an extraordinary crisis at Europe's largest nuclear power plant. Since Russian troops took it over in the first weeks of the war, shelling has plunged the facility into a blackout six times, forcing nuclear engineers to rely on diesel generators to keep the critical cooling equipment running. The plant is connected to the Ukrainian power grid by a single line that has been damaged repeatedly by shelling. International experts have raised alarm multiple times over the working conditions faced by the Ukrainian employees, many of whom have already endured abuse and harsh interrogations by Russian forces. Now, they are living in a town with no basic services and with no idea what might come next. Mr. Grossi said the situation was becoming increasingly unpredictable and potentially dangerous because the workers are facing increasingly tense, stressful and challenging conditions for personnel and their families. Turkey says talks about extending the grain deal are positive. Ukraine and Russia are getting closer to reaching an agreement to extend the imperiled Black Sea grain deal, Turkey's defense ministry said on Friday after two days of talks failed to conclusively salvage it. Moscow has threatened to pull out of the deal when it expires on May 18. Representatives from Russia, Ukraine, Turkey and the United Nations met this week for talks aimed at securing an extension to the agreement, which has allowed Ukraine to export millions of tons of grain from its ports on the Black Sea despite the war. Turkey's foreign minister, Mevlut Kavusolu, said this week that he thought the deal could be extended for at least two months. But no concrete announcement was made after talks concluded on Thursday, and Turkey's defense ministry said that talks would continue in the coming days.
The discussions were positive, Turkey's defense minister, Halusi Akar, said on Friday. There is an advance towards an agreement to extend the grain deal. The Kremlin spokesman was asked by journalists on Friday about Mr. Acker's remarks and said that there was no news to report about a possible extension. The work is underway, contacts are underway and they will continue, said the spokesman, Dmitry S. Peskov, according to Russia's TASS news agency. Moscow has repeatedly threatened to back out if impediments to its own agricultural exports are not resolved. With the fate of the deal unsettled, shipments from Ukraine dipped significantly in April. Secretary of State Antony J. Blinken and his British counterpart, James Cleverly, called on Moscow this week to immediately commit to an extension. The original agreement, brokered by Turkey and the United Nations last July, said the deal would be renewed for 120 days at a time. Twice before, it was extended just days before expiration. In March, Russia said it was only agreeing to a 60-day extension unless its demands were met. Mr. Blinken said on Tuesday that Russia was blocking ships from reaching Ukrainian ports to be loaded with grain, accusing Moscow's troops of stopping food from getting to people in need. The world shouldn't need to remind Moscow every few weeks to stop using people's hunger as a weapon in their war against Ukraine, he said. Russia's demands for the deal's extension include reconnecting its agricultural bank to the SWIFT global payment system, the lifting of restrictions on maritime insurance and the end of sanctions against major fertilizer companies. Some experts have said the demands are an attempt to soften the blow of sanctions imposed against Russia more broadly by using the deal as a bargaining chip. Kherson was a symbol of hope when it was liberated. Now, death is everywhere. Kherson, Ukraine. The road to Kherson is long, straight and empty. Vacant fields rise from either side. Entering town from the west, you pass the ATB supermarket, one of the mainstays of the city's shopping. It was blown up a few weeks ago, in the middle of the day, with shoppers inside. After that lie more crushed buildings, disassembled by Russian artillery shells. Death is everywhere, said Helena Luhova, Kherson's deputy mayor. Indeed, it comes in many forms, and at any time. People have been killed waiting for the bus, waiting for the train, walking to work and in their sleep. No city in Ukraine has experienced such a reversal of fortune as Kherson a port on the Dnipro River near the Black Sea. It was seized by Russian forces in early March 2022, then jubilantly recaptured by Ukrainian forces in November. But instead of enjoying the fruits of liberation, Kherson is now a kill zone. Zelensky's comments about needing more time for a successful counteroffensive set off a debate on any hidden agenda. For Ukrainian analysts, the answer to what he was thinking was simple. It's true, said Taras Chamut, a former military officer who heads Come Back Alive, a charitable foundation that provides military supplies for the Ukrainian army. The amount we gathered in recent months is still not enough for a successful counteroffensive. Despite the donations of billions of dollars of weaponry from the West, he said the Ukrainian army still did not have enough of everything, from ammunition and artillery shells to armored vehicles and air defense systems. He echoed the concerns of military commanders and civilians that Ukraine's air defenses were insufficient after Russia had recently increased its use of guided aviation bombs that could prove costly for Ukrainian forces. It is the decision of the senior military command whether to accept the risks, he said. But others offered different theories. Maria Zolkina, the head of regional security and conflict studies at the Kyiv-based Democratic Initiatives Foundation, said there was probably a dual purpose to Mr. Zelensky's message. It was part political statement to make the Western partners speed up those supplies, she said. But Mr. Zelensky was probably also looking to manage Western expectations in case the counteroffensive was not as successful as expected. In recent days, Ukrainian officials have already sought to manage expectations over the anticipated counteroffensive, saying that there may not be a single conclusive battle and that the public and Western allies should dial down expectations of success. It looks like we are in a Hollywood movie where a great battle for Middle-earth begins, and one battle for Gondor will decide everything. It doesn't happen like that, said Mikhailo Podoliak, an advisor to Mr. Zelensky, making a reference to the tale of, The Lord of the Rings. And then there is the possibility of intentional misdirection, to try to catch the Russians by surprise. I would not exclude that it was an informational trick as Ukraine is trying to hide its preparations, Ms. Zolkina said.
Part of the success of two Ukrainian counter-offensives in the Kharkiv and Kherson regions last fall was because the Ukrainian military let it be known that it was planning a counterattack in the south, which led Russia to move troops to the south, leaving its defenses undermanned in the northeast. Spotting the weakness, Ms. Zolkina said, the Ukrainian military command planned an attack in the northeast, surprising the Russians and retaking territory. She said Kyiv was focused on keeping Russia guessing, and it seemed to be working. A Russian order to civilians and workers to evacuate the territory it occupies around the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, she said, was a sign that the Russians did not know where the next attack was going to come from. Some Russians also said Mr. Zelensky was dissembling. Yevgeny V. Prigozhin, the head of the Wagner private military company that is leading the Russian assault to capture Bakhmut, dismissed Mr. Zelensky's comment as disingenuous in an audio message posted on Telegram by his press service.